Thank you for joining us. My name is Carrie Smith, and on behalf of Cumulus Networks, I'd like to welcome you to our hands-on technical deep dive of Prescriptive Topology Manager. Presenting today will be Dinesh Dutt. Dinesh is our Chief Scientist here at Cumulus Networks and has been in the networking industry for the past 15 years. He's been involved in enterprise and data center networking technologies, including the design of many of the ASICs that powered Cisco's mega switches, such as the CAT6000 and the Nexus family of switches. He also has experience in storage networking from his days at Andiamo Systems and in the design of FCOE. He's the co-author of Trill, VXLON, and has filed over 40 patents. The webinar today will be about 30 to 45 minutes, and we'll take, a short, we'll take short stops periodically to answer any questions you may have. For those of you interested, you have the opportunity to ask Dinesh questions during the webinar by using the window marked questions. Simply type in your questions and click send and we'll do our best to answer your questions during the webinar. Um, you can also tweet us your questions. Our Twitter handle is at Cumulus Networks. And with that, I'd like to turn this over to Dinesh. Thanks, Dinesh. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, uh, thanks, Gary, for that nice introduction. After today, you'll know me primarily as a chief idiot because of the demo. But what's a good demo if it doesn't flop? Let's uh, go through this. Um, today, uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, today I expect to do, uh, uh, do a hands-on PTM. In the last webinar that we had around class and how we manage class, we talked about PTM. At that point, I did not actually go into a, a demo where I would actually r jump around the different boxes, have a topology set up, and actually show what happens and what are the different ways in which PTM can help you. So today, the purpose of this webinar is to actually do that. Uh, I expect it to be a little interactive, and uh, I hope to uh, have questions uh, so that I could answer them. With that said, let's get started. To get everybody on board, uh, first, uh, you know, got to say a few words about Cumulus. For those of you who are not familiar with Cumulus, uh, these are the adventures of the enterprise uh, starship uh, uh, Cumulus, and uh, we are uh, going where networks haven't gone before, hopefully making them easier to uh, work with, easier to manage, and uh, also have lots of them and open innovation to everyone. So in short, our vision is to bring the Linux revolution that happened to computing to networking as well. So let's get on into the subject matter now. This is the topology that rules the modern data center. It's called the class topology, and you can see that there are things like clusters or pods, and you can see that there are multiple clusters, and then there are things like intercluster spine, which hooks them all up. And for those of you who are not familiar with CLOS, unfortunately, this would not be a great uh, step uh, to getting into details. But just as a basic understanding, this is, you know, it's a very well-rich topology that allows you to scale and is also a very simple building block. But when anybody looks at this particular topology, the first thing that becomes apparent is the fact that the number of cables is a lot. If the network cabling complexity is going to be a lot, and that's one of the problems of a cost topology, how would you go about fixing it? We've run into several customers, for example, who say, hey, I love class. I'm going to hook it up, but I have cabling problems. How would I do it? How do I resolve cabling problems? To this date, people have had issues. I mean, the way they solve it is essentially manual. And we all know that if you have cabling errors, what ends up happening is that instead of getting the behavior you want out of this network, you get a different behavior. Just about everyone worth their salt agrees that this is the topology with which the data center is going to move forward. It doesn't matter whether you're a Cisco, you're a Juniper, you're an Arista, you're a Cumulus, uh, you're a Brocade. All of the people agree that the class topology is how the modern data center works, uh, is the topology that rules the modern data center. Uh, you'd look at any large-scale customers, all of them are deploying topologies and network architectures based on this topology. So the thing that we are going to talk about today is how to make this topology even easier to manage, because one of the chief goals of Cumulus Networks is to make a topology easy to manage, to make networks easy to manage and uh, admi uh, control. So we came up with a solution, and we called it the Prescriptive Topology Manager, and the basic idea is we have all the building blocks required to actually understand whether the physical connectivity is as prescribed or as desired by the customer or the network operator. 
Anybody who is doing any basic networking understands how networks are cabled. Until unless you are running even even if you are running simply two switches together, if you don't know how your cables run, you run into problems. You don't know what to troubleshoot. So having a basic understanding, starting with the physical and making sure that the physical health check passes is a very key construct. So we assume that. For example, that when you have a class topology, you know how things are hooked up together. And we use a language called the DOT language. It's an open source language. It comes from an open source package called GraphWiz. And it's a very simple uh, construct. And as you can see in the topology graph, it essentially says switch S1 has a port P1, and it's connected to uh, switch M1 on port P3. And this is just repeated uh, for the entire network. You essentially take this entire topology graph and dump it on every single switch in your network. The switch then parses this file to figure out what its role is. So for example, M1 will only parse out the section that applies to it. S1 will parse out the section that applies to it. And <clears throat> essentially make sure using LLDP that the connectivity is as expected. LLDP is a standard protocol which tells you what on every link, uh, every node announces what, who it is. And the other side of the link can receive this message and understand what needs to be done. So with that said, we would get essentially in this particular uh, mechanism, using wire this mechanism, PTM is a daemon. It essentially looks at this graph, parses out who it is, makes sure that it gets through LLDP, who it's connected to, verifies that the connectivity is as expected. If it is not as expected, it takes an action, which could be something that you define, or it could be a set of predefined actions. And if it passes, it takes a different set of predefined actions. So we come, we come with a set of predefined actions. The primary predefined action is essentially to hook up with Quagga and pass information whether an uh, interface has passed or failed uh, a particular match. So if your physical connectivity is not as you expect it to be, uh, then that particular interface is shown as fail, and the relevant information is not passed up to protocols like OSPF, and thereby OSPF will not bring up the routing adjacency, for example. You have a simple uh, utility to take a look at what the output looks like to show whether the cabling check has passed and uh, who its peer is. So PTM is an open source. We have it hosted on GitHub, and uh, you can download it. And we keep updating it every time we make a release so that the version up there is similar to what we are releasing. Uh, it's also GitHub, so uh, you can make patches to it. If you find problems, please let us know. We'll be happy to take contributions. This is supposed to be a community effort. This is not something that Cumulus necessarily wants to control. So uh, we welcome any contributions, and uh, we'll keep that particular source updated. So with that said, we'll move on to the demo section of this presentation. Uh, do people have any questions so far about uh, any of the stuff that we have discussed? If not, we'll just go straight on to the demo. Uh, hey, Dinesh, let's just, let's just move on to the demo. No questions yet. Okay. okay. So in the demo, instead of showing you something, uh, instead of showing you something that is a uh, mock topology, something that's used merely for a demo purposes, I thought I would show you something that applies to a real customer. This is a real customer topology. This is something that uh, we know of a customer who is actually having a topology like this. Essentially, it's a simple, there are a few points that I want to make about this topology. A lot of people say, oh, PTM, isn't that something that only big vendors need? If I'm a small network operator with just eight racks, 10 racks, is it something that I care about? So here is a customer who's got about 16 racks, and in this topology I just show eight, but they essentially have 16 racks with a four-way spine, and every cluster, every clause looks slightly different because people do slightly different things with it, which is why we encourage customization rather than uh, allowing people to say that this is a cookie cutter approach, you've got to do exactly as we tell you, or things don't work. So in this particular topology of this customer, they essentially have got uh, 16 nodes. In this example, I'm showing you eight nodes, where two nodes, L7 and L8, which are the leaf nodes, uh, are connected to a border router. So L7 and L8 are typically called border routers. 
and uh, BR1 and uh, or rather border leaves and BR1 and BR2 are the border routers which are connected to the internet. You essentially have IBGP peering going on between the border leaf and the border router. Everywhere else you are running OSPF. L7 and L8, for example, are running OSPF between spines S1 through S4, and they're running IBGP between spy, between on uh, to border routers as well as part of this topology. So this is the topology that we'll kind of take a look at and uh, walk through. So I see a couple of questions. I'll kind of answer them. W one question is, why not prevent the port from coming up itself instead of marking it as fail? So one of the things that happens when you Put, that's a good question, but that is not something that we necessarily want to mandate as a mechanism. For example, as part of the if topo action, one of the things when things fail, you can write a command in the script which says IP link set the port down, and the port will be set down. But not every customer wants to make the port go down. They want to actually troubleshoot and figure out what is at the other end of the link, and maybe there is some bug in their script rather than in their uh, in the actual configuration. They want to troubleshoot it. So not everybody wants to actually shut a link down on an error. But that choice is up to you. It's up to the customer. If you want to bring the link down, you are welcome to do so. The other uh, question is: Does PTM work for layer two as well as layer three links? PTM does not is independent of layer 2 or layer 3 it runs off of LLDP so because it uses LLDP it just runs on the link it is even independent to for example on bond you could potentially use it to say if ptm fails don't bring up don't add that link to a bond for example just so you avoid bond bond errors as an example and with respect to a uh, question of uh, uh, what's the word for it? Uh, whether uh, what's the connection of PTM and BFD? I won't get into the details of this, but essentially the dot uh, representation is a network-wide config. So you could use it to configure network-wide policies, such as, for example, to enable BFD on certain links. That was the basic point of it. And uh, I have another question here, which says, why do I have four spines, not two spines? This is a real customer topology. The primary reason why people choose more than two is because they don't want a single failure to essentially make them lose 50% of your network bandwidth. And you know, granted, this is eight nodes, uh, eight racks with four spines. It kind of looks like, hey, isn't that an overkill? But it depends also on how many servers are connected to each of the leaves. And they have 16. This particular customer that I'm showing this as a realistic topology of has 16, and they have four spines. But typically, people tend to deploy more than two spines simply because they don't want a link failure to actually result in 50% of the network bandwidth coming down. With that said, this is the topology that I will be going. I'll be demoing. And essentially, what we have is I have set up a demo here with all of this pre-configured. Uh, essentially, I have four spines. I have eight uh, leaves, and those eight, uh, two of those leaves, L7 and L8, are peering with border routers BR1 and BR2 via IBGP. Um, so, with that said, I want to kind of go on to the demo section of it, and uh, I'll just take a minute to get on to uh, the sharing part of it. So, just give me a second while I get share applications and terminate. So hopefully people can actually see the screen that is up there. Uh, please tell me if uh, the screen, if you want me to increase the font size, I can increase the font size a little bit. Is this clear to everyone? Can people really see this well? Uh, if it is, then I will assume so, and I'll proceed. And this is a setup that we have, and uh, I'm just kind of kind of walk through some of this stuff. So this is a switch running Cumulus uh, Linux, and uh, this is a VM actually, and we have a real switch. So in this demo L7, if you go to L7, you'll see that it shows a box which is Acton 5652, and it's a real switch. Uh, but for the sake of this demo, I'm just kind of m monkeying around with a VM as well. So we don't have as many switches. We are a small startup. So we do a lot of work with VMs. So anyway, here is a topology where if you look at the topology file, you can see that the configuration has been set up for the topology that, you, that we described. Essentially, you will see that there are two border routers 
which are connected to the two leaves, one of which is L7, the other is L8. And then you can see that there are, I have a few hosts. The hosts are actually not enabled in this particular uh, demo, uh, demo uh, but you can hook up hosts as well and verify connectivity to hosts. But essentially you can see that the leaves are connected. You see the leaves are connected to the four spines. Every leaf is a repeat. It's essentially connected to the four spines. And that's a regular class topology. And like I said, we have got the BR1, the leaf 7 and leaf 8 connected to the border routers which is shown here, but the rest of it is connected to the same four ports exactly like before. So this is the topology. And right now you will see that you essentially have OSPF, and if you look at the neighbor, it essentially shows you that you have four spines, and all the four spines are hooked up as you expect them to be hooked up, and that everything is working correctly. So this is the topology, and you can even do things like IP route. This is Linux, so you can essentially do all kinds of uh, standard Linux commands. This, what I'm typing here via OSPF, CLOSPF is essentially the non-modal CLI that, Cisco, that we have as part of our uh, layer 3 uh, interfaces to our routing protocols. So uh, here is an example. And so what I have here is I want to show you uh, a few things. I want to show you what the running configuration looks like on this particular box. The running configuration is essentially uh, the leaves that you see, and you see that essentially all the uh, OSPF interfaces are defined as OSPF area 000. Everything is hooked up correctly. Everything is looking as you expect it to be. In this particular topology, I don't have any specific configuration in the Quagga. There is no predefined hookup with respect to Quagga and PTM. So now what we will do, uh, we will look at another script which is essentially the script that we will use uh, for if, topo, if the topology check passes. So what the script says is it essentially the first few lines up to here uh, parse the output that PTM gives you. And uh, P here is a port. And if this is a pass, since the file is called if topo pass, this, fun this file is invoked. And the script that is here, this is a bash script. It can be a Python program. It can be anything you want uh, as long as it's an executable. This is run. The command that is the option that is passed or the input that is passed to it, which is $1, is essentially a prefix, a header, and data. And you can essentially run this. And if the topology passes, what we will do is we will add that interface to uh, OSPF. And there is a similar one for fail. And if it fails, essentially we will eliminate, we'll remove that interface from OSPF configuration. That's the basic idea here. It's very simple. There is nothing much going on. So now what we will do is since everything is passed, everything is working, you'll see that every, all the nodes have passed. SWP 1, 2, 3, 4 have all passed. So life is looking beautiful. And so that is why OSPF says that it's perfectly communicating with everyone. This is a simulation, so what the way to make it work is I can't really walk around and pull out cables and miscable them. What we will do instead is we'll just change the specification. We are on node L1, and we can go change on this node just to give you an example. I'll just go change L2 specification. We are not node L2. We change the specification of it, and we don't expect anything to happen. Let's just ask PTM to re-read the file and figure out what's going on. Now if you look at PTM detail, it still says everything is passed. Because as far as it's concerned, it is not node L2. It is node L1. So it ignores any uh, information about node L2. This file is not synced across all the boxes. So node L2 has its copy of it, and life is good over there. And we'll get to node L2 in one second. But if you look at node uh, L1, let's go back now and uh, fix this. And let's go actually mess up node L1. So we'll say right now it should be connected to spine 1 on port 1, but let's just say that we expect it to be connected to port 2. And just to give you a sense of what is going on, I will type in all the commands again so you are aware of what is going on. And you will see that everything is a pass. You will see CL OSPF, and if you see the neighbor, you will see that essentially there are four neighbors. They are connected to SWP 1, 2, 3, and 4. Now with the modification done, let's reconfigure. We'll ask PTM to reread the file. Now this is what would happen. I am simulating a link up and link down using 
service PTMD reconfig in real life when a link flaps, when a cable is connected, etc. Uh, the link will go down and come up and PTM will automatically read all that information. So I am not, you don't have to go type reconfig every time a link flaps. This is something that I'm doing simply because I'm modifying the topology file uh, for the basis of demonstrating uh, the functionality. So when you type this and then you say, okay, what is the detail? Show me, oh, what happened here? What's a good, what's a demo if it doesn't fail, huh? Where did it go? I have hooked it up to S1 and SWP2. I am on node 1, and it still says that it is passing. Huh. What happened right here? Let's take a look at OSPF neighbor. And you see the neighbor is all correct, so at least everything is hooked up as we expect it to be. But this was a working demo a few minutes back. L1 SWP1 is connected to S1 SWP2, which is how it's supposed to be. Let's just type service PTMD start. And now you see that it essentially has failed, and if you run neighbor, you see that SWP1 has essentially vanished from the OSPF configuration. SWP1 is no longer part of the configuration OSPF because essentially we said if the topology has failed, it is not supposed to uh, be part of the OSPF routing configuration and we have pulled it out of the routing configuration. In addition to actually doing something like this, you could potentially add a log message uh, to uh, the uh, syslog and you can then monitor syslog using various tools to verify that you have to take appropriate action if uh, a link fails. But this is an example of what's going on, and now let's go back and uh, update the topology, and we expect it to pass after this. And it's a pass, and OSPF neighbor, you see, SWP1 is back again and life is looking good here. So this is an example of showing how using uh, PTM you could control the bringing up of routing adjacency, but you are essentially doing that through topo pass and topo fail scripts, and you could use topo pass and topo fail scripts to do all kinds of interesting things, and we'll go on with other uh, things that we could do over here. But this is an example. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, Dinesh, we do have a few questions coming in. The first one is, when is the PTM invoked? What is the trigger for it to work? So if you look at the process uh, state over here, PTM is running at when the system starts up, essentially PTM will be running. And when PTM is running, it's essentially monitoring. It sets up a communication channel with the LLDP daemon, and it's listening to the LLDP daemon, and it's LLDP daemon sends notification to all registered clients whenever there is a status change to LLDP. When a link goes down, when a link comes up, uh, when the other side sends new information, in all of those cases, LLDP will send the right information, will send updates to the client. And PTM D, which is the daemon, is just a client of LLDP D that's running all the time. Because it's running all the time, uh, you can have a link go down, a link come up, and PTM will immediately verify the connectivity and take the appropriate actions. Next question. Uh, next question, um, and this one actually came in just a little bit ago. Um, is there a way to glean the topology from what is discovered by LLDP and generate the dot graph rather than take it as an input to do the matching of what is the expected topology versus what is actually connected. A hand yes, graph. there is a way to do that. Uh, we have a pro that's not part of what is a shipping code right now. But towards the end of this, I will uh, give a, I will show you uh, something that one of our uh, support engineers actually a customer support engineers uh, or uh, sales engineer put together. Uh, to sh do exactly what you said. We have various scripts to do that, and that's something that you can actually do. We don't ship that as part of our uh, product right now. One of the reasons why I frown a little upon it 
is because I feel that people need to understand what their topology looks like. If they don't know what their topology looks like, then the chances of running off of a bad topology and making all kinds of errors and then getting confused is very easy. However, on the other hand, if your reason to get the base topology to use something like LLDP and to derive a, a basic uh, file is to just get started, then that's something that's possible. But I'll show you something like that towards the end of this uh, particular uh, demo. Any other questions? Okay, one more question. Uh, actually, two more questions. Um, is it necessary to restart PTMD if the topology dot dot is edited, or is it the case? that it is read via a lazy timer reading in the background? No, we essentially expect you to do the equivalent of reconfig every time uh, it is. We don't have a timer running in the background to do a diff. Uh, typically, uh, we would be able to do something like an iNotify call, which essentially registers and uh, you get a notification from the kernel every time the file changes. We haven't done some of those kinds of work. Uh, but those are all possible. Today you will have to do the equivalent of reconfig. And let me also tell you another reason why we do something uh, like reconfig. If you think about how this is automated, how the network is set up for a lot of customers, they use something like Puppet or Chef. For example, in the case of the customer's topology that I'm demonstrating, that customer is using Puppet. Uh, and they push out the configs every time. So they expect you to actually, when they push out the config, they will reject the services. So for example, in this particular case, uh, we say service PTMD reconfig. That's what you do with most other services when you modify the configuration file. That's just the Linuxy way of doing things. So we just adhere to that Linuxy way of doing things. Okay, perfect. And next question. Um, and then we can move on with your demo. Can an SDM controller use PTM and LLDP to manage the topology connection? So the question is, can an SDN controller do SDN to me is uh, the SDN controller is such a how shall I say uh, vague word that it can be anything. It's to me like God. Sure, it can do anything it wants. Uh, but if your question is, can I pull this information from a remote node and then push out specific information to each of these switches to be able to do certain interesting actions, absolutely you can do that. You can uh, run the equivalent of PTM CTL. You can run SSH to any of the nodes, get the equivalent of the node PTM CTLs, and then put them together yourself on the controller, and based on that take appropriate actions. That's something you can do. Uh, for example, someone demonstrated that on a controller you could do the complete opposite of what I'm demonstrating, which is they essentially were running topology. They, they had the graph of the network running on a controller. They queried each switch for its LLDP, then put it together, made sure that everything worked correctly, and then pushed out all the appropriate information to each of the nodes. Uh, there's a web page out there. I believe it was put out by a guy called Jason Edelman. Uh, our model here is that you essentially do everything. Ours is a distributed model because that's how networks work. They are distributed. Each node works independently, makes certain promises to other nodes, and then adheres to whatever it promises. And here in this particular case, PTMD is running on the node, and it can take whatever actions you want. Any questions? Let's see. Uh, yes, one more question. Is there are there tools to make this more graphical? Yes, there are some tools to make it more graphical. One of the reasons we picked Graph uh, uh, Dot Language is it comes as part of a package called GraphWiz. It's an open source tool. Now, granted, it's not the best tool to actually display uh, class topologies. Uh, that's uh, a nice little project that we have not really embarked upon, uh, but. It is, you do have tools out there that can uh, actually show you visually what is the topology. And towards the end of this demo, I will show you one that one of our engineers, like I said, put together, uh, which not only displays the derived topology from LLDP, but it also has, shows you a graph. He does a visualization. And uh, it, you, you can see how simple it is uh, towards the end. Great. Uh, and the next question, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go on. Okay. Um, can you roll back a configuration by one command, or do you have to actually edit and reconfigure to back out? So the question about whether you can uh, roll back uh, configuration, we don't support. This is Linux, so we don't have any standard, you know, uh, default mechanisms to roll back. You can implement it using things like HC Keeper. We have a mechanism called CL Persistify. Uh, what uh, 
I believe that's an experimental package, so it doesn't exist. So on this particular node, but you can type something called CL Persistify, which essentially uses Etsy Keeper to take a backup of your, a snapshot of your current Etsy directory. So all your configuration is saved. You can make changes, and then you can say roll it back, and it will roll back. I want to get moving on to the demo uh, uh, b before I take some more questions because there are a few more uh, things that we need to do. Uh, I will move on to a different node. So I, on node L1, I gave you a demonstration of how you could use if topo pass and if topo fail to actually control the routing adjacency and routing configuration. On node 2, I have a slightly different model. If you look at uh, ptmd topology dot dot, it looks identical. There is no difference between this and the other file. If you look at if topo pass and if topo fail, however, you'll see that everything is commented out. There is really nothing going on in this particular uh, thing. But if you look at the equivalent of the PTM, um, of the Quagga config on the other hand, you will notice a line here called PTM enable. <laughs> what this says is Quagga, I want you to please communicate with PTM and pass on the appropriate information uh, and take action on it. In this particular topology, uh, first of all, forgive me everyone, I have a bad cold and I keep sniffling. Uh, forgive my sniffling. Uh, in this particular topology, the entire configuration is set up. Everything is configured, everything is set up, and nothing is being modified. The only line you have added is PTM enable. By typing PTM enable, you are telling Quagga, please take control and take the appropriate actions. So in this particular topology, if you look at the output of, say, SWP1, you will see that it is a pass. Life is good. Everything is working. So if you look at now going and modifying the topology, since we are on node L2, we got to go modify something that's relevant to L2. And let's change that and say essentially that you need to be node, uh, you should be connected to port 1 on S1 instead of port 2, which is what it's connected to. So just to make sure, <coughs> you will see that it is essentially showing that all of them are passed. They are all connected to who they need to be connected to. OSPF says the neighbor is all good. Everybody is connected. now. Since the topology pass and topology file uh, fail files are completely empty and all we have is an additional knob called PTM enable, we will just go and having modified the file, ask PTM to reconfigure, reread the file and show what is going on. If you see now, you will see that SWP1 has failed. And now if you look at CLOSPF neighbor, you will see that one of the interfaces which is SWP1 has gone. If you do, okay, why is it gone? Interface show SWP1, you will see that the PTM status is failed. And you can look at details to say, hey, show me more details about what has failed. And you can see that it's supposed to be connected to SWP1, instead it is connected to SWP2, and that's why it has failed. <coughs> So this is another example where we use a predefined hookup between Quagga and PTM to ensure that any changes in PTM are appropriately handled by Quagga and the right behavior happens. So if you don't want to go through the me mechanism of actually configuring uh, if topo pass or if topo fail and all you want is to control Quagga, then this is a simple example of how you can make that happen. And to kind of bring everything back to normal, we can go back to topo, the topology file, change it back to 1, and ask PTM to reread the file, and now you will see that it is, oh, I changed the wrong guy. Replace 2, replace 2. Now everything is passed. And if you look at OSPF, all four neighbors are up. If you look at <clears throat> PTM status is passed. So this is an, uh, another example of how you could use a simple predefined hookup to allow PTM to control what you're doing. 
again this is a demonstration of a simple topology this is not a very complex topology but it's a real customer topology this is not a fake topology uh, a customer uses this as a blueprint so you say if this is a simple topology why use any form of ptm what the customer does is essentially because they are get, getting to be very successful they are built putting rolling out this particular blueprint this topology blueprint in every single uh, in many data centers. They are coming up with new data centers all the time and they want to roll this out in all the new data centers. If they have a topology that looks like this and they, they are assured that PTM or something like PTM will take care of uh, failures, then they can be comfortable in shipping this out, having uh, unskilled labor, for example, put uh, configuration in and make sure that everything will work. And if it doesn't work, to actually get notification that it isn't working. We have a customer who has rolled out PTM across 100 and, I'm sorry, 240 racks, and they said they had 20% cabling errors. And PTM, without PTM, it was a nightmare for them to actually figure out what to do. But with PTM, they were able to catch what were the failed links pretty quickly or the miscabled links pretty quickly and then go fix it. Uh, for example, one, if the particular switch that you have supports it, one of the things you can do as part of the if topo pass or if topo fail script is to actually start blinking that link or change the color of that link. So then someone could actually go take a look at the port link to decide which link is actually the one that is miscabled. Any questions? Hey, Dinesh, we uh, do have a question coming in. Um, Generally, I would expect that there is one central copy of the topology dot dot, which is changed and then pushed to all leaves for consistency. Um, I suppose what you are showing by modifying the copies is just for demo, is that correct? And assuming that you would use Puppet, Chef, or a similar mechanism to do that? Yep, you are absolutely right. There is a central copy and that is why PTM uh, has the, the question earlier question of BFD and the relation all is tied up. PTM is a single file that is set up in one place and pushed out. So any modifications you make to it is pushed out to all the nodes and the modifications I'm doing here is only for the demo purposes. Again, it doesn't mean that you can't go modify local copies but that's not how it is typically done. That's not how administrators do it. Okay, that's great. Uh, there, there are no more questions right now. Okay, go ahead. so having shown you demo in the first aspect, I showed you how to use if topo pass. In the second one, I showed you how if topo fail. Let's take a look at another one and let's take a look and see what this one has. <laughs> you see, the if topo pass has nothing going on in it. If topo fail, however, uh, oh. It doesn't have anything. Let's go fix if topo fail and say, you know what? I want you to actually uh, log a message if there is a failure. So we could just add this particular output. So this essentially says, if there's a failure, please log it. Logger is a program that runs on Linux. It essentially logs things to syslog. You can go take a look at that. If you look at what is running in Quagga, you see that there is no PTM enable. So I have not enabled anything. So things can work or not work. It doesn't really matter. But let's go ahead and uh, enable PTM. And verify that it is there. You can see that PTM enable is enabled now. And now let's go, and we are on node L3. So let's, for the sake of a demonstration, go modify a topology dot dot file on L3 and see what happens. I've been modifying SWP1 all the time for the sake of messing up the demo again. Let's go modify a different port and say sudo service. PTMD. Oh, before you go there, you want to see the neighbors. The neighbors are all full. Everything is looking good. And now, <coughs> PTMCTL, you can see that everything is passed. Now, if you say PTMD reconfig, it's reconfigured. And you can see that SW2 has failed. If you look at CLOSPF, neighbor, you'll see that SWP2 is missing from this link. 
But if you look at Wars's log, you will see this link here that essentially SWPT2 has failed. <coughs> <coughs> And the point of this is you can have predefined hooks and you can have your own defined hooks, customized hooks to do various things. They can work in tandem. It's not one or the other. So for example, if you don't want the routing adjacency to come up, you can just go add PTM enable inside uh, the Quagga config and then decide to beacon a link if you want as part of the topo fail in, this config in your uh, customized script. So this shows you that PTM, as it is, uh, works very much like a Linux tool. It has predefined hooks. It can also do customized hooks based on what it is that you as a customer want. All of the uh, d d demonstrations here have been done using Bash, but it could be Python. It doesn't really matter. <coughs> Any questions uh, before I move on to the next phase? Um, yeah, one quick question. Who is supporting PTM today? Uh, cumulus. And uh, to be very clear about it, we, it's an open source project. It does not require that every node in the network support PTM in order for this to be successful. For example, in the topology that we have, if you choose to say that what I have uh, are spines which are from a different vendor and all the top of racks are from Cumulus or vice versa, or I have only a couple of nodes which are Cumulus and the rest of them are not Cumulus, you can put in uh, enable PTMD on only one side of the link, which is the cumulus side of the link. And the nice part about routing is that if one side of the link decides that it's not going to speak, the other side of the link is not going to be able to do anything. So this is completely interoperable because we use LLDP, which is a standard protocol that about just about every vendor out there supports. It's a program that also runs on hosts, so you can also run it on hosts. But on all the variety of switches that I'm aware of, Cisco, Juniper, Arista, Brocade, all of them support LLDP. Uh, even VMware, for example, runs LLDP on its uh, ESX. So you have support from all the different platforms and vendors to support LLDP. And if you enable it on just the cumulus side of the network, then that's sufficient for you to get the behaviors that you want. Any other question? Nope, we're all good. Okay, so moving on to the next part of the demo, this is the real hard node. And in this that I'm, like I mentioned, if you look at what is going on and you look at the running config here, you see that I have to make a modification because I was trying to do something here and it did not work. And that's my bash scripting problem. <coughs> so in this particular topology, we have only one neighbor right now. So we can go ahead and add the other neighbor. And you can see that now SWP5 is a neighbor that has been added, uh, and it will get active in a second. Uh, so this is all the links that are down. Uh, you can see what are the uplinks, and you can see what are the addresses on these links uh, that are configured. So you can see SWP5 is up now. And you can see that this is something that we do. We have extended BGP to allow interface-based configuration because typically with BGP, it works off of IP addresses, which you see here. And if things work off of IP addresses, then, <coughs> then it is not possible for you to actually control without very complicated scripts uh, the behavior of BGP when PTM passes or fails. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't uh, get the uh, demo part of it working because you can see that I was trying in the if topo pass part of the configuration that I essentially was saying that if it is a SWP5, then go ahead and add this to BGP. 
and if it is fail, uh, essentially pull that neighbor, delete that neighbor from BGP configuration. That is essentially the configuration. <clears throat> And the basic idea again is in case of BGP, if you look at again the running configuration, the BGP has a whole bunch of stuff, but essentially you use a mechanism called peer groups, and peer groups allows you to define a template of your expected behavior, and then just go ahead and add the new neighbors as they come up to uh, the template so the template if properties are inherited by each of the neighbors and the right things happen. So using again something as simple as uh, if topo pass and if topo fail or using things like uh, PTM enable, you can control how BGP reacts uh, to uh, uh, PTM pass or fail. And this is an example of how using things like unnumbered BGP or essentially interface based BGP configuration, you could actually have PT, uh, you could actually make your BGP configuration quite simple. So like I said again, uh, here is an example. I couldn't get the demo working up. And this feature of trying to use uh, an interface based configuration uh, is shipping in Cumulus boxes today. It works only with V6. We have a solution that works for V4 as well, and that will be in the upcoming release. Uh, but uh, that's what I'm demonstrating here. And in this particular case, essentially, if you remember from the configuration that I mentioned, all I'm getting from the border router is the default route. And if you look at what I'm, what I have, what has been received, uh, sorry, uh, this is on the border router. Uh, Oh, did the border routers die? You should have received a prefix, and <clears throat> you should see that if you have the route, the route essentially the default route is being advertised. Uh, I apologize, some of this uh, demo was being set up at the last minute, and so uh, some of the stuff was a little uh, was a little out of whack as I was trying to get this to work. Uh, so anyway, uh, this route is announced, the default route is announced, and uh, you have a way to see that the unnumbered interface works off of an IPv4 prefix as well. It's not just for IPv6 prefixes. Any questions before I move on to the next part of the demo? Uh, and then actually, yes, there are a few questions coming in. Um, how do you show a port channel in the topology file? <clears throat> Pardon? How do you what show is the question how do you show port channel in the topology file? Ah, the question is how do I show port channel on a topology file or essentially what is called uh, either bonding in the Linux terminology. Uh, you don't have a way to show bonding. You don't specify bonding in the topology file because the topology file is essentially a physical connectivity. It is not logical connectivity. And a bond is a logical interface. What you would do is in your if topo pass or if topo fail script, you would add the link that passed. LLDP runs, let's back up one more step. LLDP runs on the physical links. It does not run on the bond link. So what you would do as part of adding of if topo pass or if topo fail is that in if topo pass, if a member that's supposed to be part of a bond passes a muster, that is, it, it, it is connected to who it says it's supposed to be connected to at the other end, you add that to the bond. If it is not, you pull it out of the bond. So you would do it that way using the if topo pass, if topo fail scripts. It's not something you would do uh, in the topology dot dot file itself because that just represents physical uh, connectivity, not logical. Okay, great. And next question, and uh, let's see. Will PTM react to events? Uh, link down real time, or it's only done after running a command, i.e., re reconfig. Uh, it reacts real time, and if you want to uh, see that, let's go take a look at uh, something. 
So here is an example of uh, IP link, uh, IP minus BR link. And you see that essentially SWP 1, 2, 3, 4 are all up. And to do this, let me uh, demo network setup. And uh, I want to just uh, go here and um, show a particular thing, which is I can bring the link down here, link control, uh, the demo on L1, just bring SWP1 down. <clears throat> so this is part of the demo setup again. This is what we use internally to do our testing. Uh, so essentially, I'm going to bring the link down. And if you go into the demo right now and you look at what's happened with the link, you'll see that SWP1 is down. I haven't typed a single command, and PTM CTL should show SWP1 is gone. So SWP1 is essentially not part of the setup because the link went down. So PTM reacts to links uh, right away. It does not link failures right away. And also, similarly, let's go and bring the link up. Go back in here, and you should see uh, IP minus BR link you'll see that SWP1 is up, and PTM CTL minus L should show that SWP1 is back. I didn't type anything about reconfig. So it essentially reacts to link failures and link bringing up right away, and then it does all the right things all the time. So if you mess up the configuration, it will do the right thing right away. So one example of a demo could be, for example, I could just change the configuration file, go out, come back in, uh, flap the link and you could see that PTM would say like, oh, I was supposed to be connected to X, but now I'm connected to Y, therefore something is wrong. Uh, it's a light, slightly more elaborated uh, configuration, so I did not do that. Any other questions? Uh, no, no more questions right now. Okay. <clears throat> so I want to show one more, uh, more thing that we have going, and I will do that by So this is a topology. So people ask the question, uh, how do I, do you have a visualization program? Is it something that I can do? Is there a mechanism for me to actually generate uh, the dot file from uh, the existing LLDP configuration? So this is a demo called PTM Viz. It is on GitHub as well. You can go download it. It's put together using basic open source tools. And what you essentially do there is you can see here that this is based on LLDP adjacencies. This is the derived topology dot dot file. This is running on something called a Cumulus Workbench. Cumulus Workbench is something that you guys uh, have access to if you want to test out Cumulus products without actually having to buy it. Uh, anyway, um, coming back to this, uh, you see that we, this is a visualization tool. It's something that is put together. It's not pretty, but it shows you the basic idea. The link in red is one that says like, hey, I don't, this link is not supposed to be connected the way it is, uh, therefore it is in red. The rest of the links are all green, which means that life is good. The ones in gray are, I haven't received an update about the status. So for example, you'll see that they are all associated with each two, each three, they are links which we are not connected up. And the yellow link essentially says, I see a link which is not part of the topology configuration that you gave me, but it is there and I see it, so I marked it in yellow. So if you see a link that is you know, a cable that should not be there, this is essentially showing you something that is in yellow. So this is an example again of something that's been put together very simply uh, by uh, an engineer at our place. It says that there are four uh, agents, that there are devices, and there are 19. And to the question of the uh, gentleman who asked, can I do things from a controller, this is an example of doing things from a controller. This is running on a server. This particular program is running on a server, and it is uh, uh, using web interface to display all of this. But what it is doing is also running an agent on every single cumulus switch. And that agent is not something that's proprietary. It's something that this engineer put together, but you can put together a similar one. And the, uh, all the agent, the server, all of this is up on GitHub as well. So you can go download it and uh, play with it. But here is an example of you having to do things that you can do things from a central controller and have visualization and take appropriate actions. With that, uh, I think uh, we are coming to the end of the hour and uh, the end of the demo. I hope uh, you found this useful. If you have questions, uh, please let me know. Uh, and uh, 
thank you again for making the time and thank the, <laughs> there are here are the resources that are available for those of you who are interested in all the resources uh, so go ahead and uh, take a look at them uh, get in touch with us uh, i hope you found this useful i hope uh, you like ptm and uh, i hope uh, you get to use it, uh, contribute to it, and it becomes a part of your network admin arsenal. Thanks again. Awesome. Thanks, Dinesh. We're out of time now. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. We hope you found this technical deep dive useful. Um, join us February 25th, where we will be partnering with <coughs> Nutanix to discuss deploying true hyperconvergence with open networking. Details are available on our website, cumulusnetworks.com slash webinars. Or you can join us each week for Coffee with Cumulus, where we do a product overview and introduction to Cumulus Linux. Um, all details are on our website at cumulus, Linux, cumulus sorry cumulusnetworks.com slash webinars. Thank you everyone for your time today. Thank you, Dinesh. Always a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Bye everyone.